Hamster Wheel Publishing. This is Blunt Dissection. I'm Dave Nichol. Welcome, folks, to episode five of Blunt Dissection. This is a monster episode. I'm very excited to bring you. I had two awesome guests. Let me tell you about them. The first is Dr. Karen Bradley. Karen has been a vet for over 20 years and have been inspired by working alongside a group of very strong female leaders early in her career, as is now the solo owner of a successful vet practice in Vermont, USA. She's been super active within the realm of US veterinary politics as well, with numerous roles, and she currently sits in the board of directors for AVMA, that's the American Veterinary Medical Association. One of the things Karen observed during her career was that there are many women in veterinary medicine, but not very many women in leadership positions, and so she decided she should be doing something about that. And that something was setting about founding an organization called the NFP Women's Veterinary Leadership Development Initiative. More on that in the podcast. My second guest is Dr. Kim Therrien. Kim graduated from the University of Montreal and has a somewhat different career path to normal, starting out as a Canadian customs officer before heading off to vet school. After graduation, Kim relocated to the US and began her career with Banfield and has worked there ever since, rapidly progressing and rising through the ranks to her current role, which is Vice President of Veterinary Quality for the Midwest region. And I can assure you that is a pretty big position, carrying a lot of responsibility, and she oversees care across over 150 hospitals. If that was not enough, Kim has been a board member of the Banfield Foundation since 2015 and this year became a board member of the Women's Veterinary Leadership Development Initiative. This was, I'm sure you have no surprise in hearing, an absolutely awesome conversation with two fabulous ladies and we covered an awful lot of ground including topics like women in leadership, fear, imposter syndrome, managing time as a business owner, and many, many other areas that affect us all in veterinary medicine. So sit back and enjoy my conversation with Karen and Kim. I hope you like it. It was an awesome podcast to make, and I think you're going to get a lot of amazing information out of it. Enjoy. So I am here at CVC in Virginia Beach. Uh, it's been a great conference. Uh, the weather has been lovely. We're surrounded by, it's a fantastic conference center actually, amazing architecture. Lots of dolphins hung from the roof. Um, so if you hear a little burbling in the background, then it's lunchtime and there's people drifting past here. Um, I'm very, very uh, pleased to be joined by two of the speakers at the CBC conference, um, Kim and Karen. And uh, we are going to talk and focus on the interesting things that uh, these two very, very talented ladies are doing to promote leadership and particularly female leadership within the profession. Um, so the conversation is going to go down that route. Uh, I expect I'll be doing an awful lot less speaking than I normally would be doing. Um, and I expect we'll get some really interesting stuff out of this. So Karen, if I would start with you, welcome, welcome to Blunt Dissection. Thanks Hi. for being on. Thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. Um, I'm just going to, rather than me introduce you, why don't you paint the picture, tell the listeners who are you, what's your background, and how did you arrive at this part of your journey? Okay, well, I'm a veterinarian, obviously, to be on here, and I'm not one of those veterinarians who knew since she was a toddler that she wanted to be a veterinarian. I actually... You didn't watch James Harriet then? I, I read, I did watch those, actually, <laughs> I, and I own the whole series, but I didn't decide until I was a freshman in college that I wanted to be a veterinarian, so I'm a late bloomer, I That's call it. That's interesting. So what was the... What was the decision point? What influenced you to go well, that Well, I really had been a fine arts school for high school and middle school, and I played the flute, and I actually had a flute scholarship. So, but I had family members who were practical. My dad, um, who said, you can't play the flute for a living, Karen. I might have been able to, actually, but I loved science. I was good at math. I said, huh, what else should I do that's more practical? And we had two puppies that we had gotten at home and going to the local veterinarian with them, there was a female veterinarian and I just thought, huh, I could do that. That would be a 
cool job and changed my major to biology and managed to get into veterinary school, uh, first try even. So kind of went straight through. Did you in the end do three degrees to get there or am I misunderstanding the U.S. Nope. education system? I w yes. So for us, we do uh, four years of college yep. at most of the time and then four years of veterinary school. Got it. Okay. And that's what I did. So right. I graduated 20 years ago. It doesn't seem that long that's ago. That's almost snap with me. <laughs> Not quite. I'm, I'm 98. Yeah, 96. Yeah, so right. it's uh, unbelievably, it's gone fast. Blink of an eye. And so talk us through um, the journey from that, that point then to where you are. Let, let's uh, just paint the picture of, of your life and your journey in veterinary medicine. Well, part of it's probably what I expected. I expected to go into companion animal medicine. And once I was in veterinary school, though, I actually loved the large animal and mixed animal medicine enough that I contemplated trying to do that. But I felt my confidence dealing with those animals and the people who owned them would not be as good since I hadn't grown up around them enough. So I did stick with companion animal. First job wasn't a good fit. I think a lot of people go through that. It was just pretty much took a job, didn't negotiate my salary or do any of the things I recommend people to do and just happy to be hired and have a job. Wasn't a good fit because it was just a one other veterinarian who was not a great mentor to me. And I ended up leaving that and going into emergency work. And that was wonderful. Trial by fire. Yeah. I think of it like the internship that actually pays. <laughs> and you learn <laughs> and you actually get to do things. So I wasn't standing around watching GDV surgeries. I was having to do You're them in the them. middle of the night. And I was someone who could do that and not, not just implode. So that was very good for me clinically. And I moved to Vermont a few years later into the practice I'm still at now so so and you're an owner of your practice now i am and that was a little bit of an evolution because i said i would never do that <laughs> i swore when i graduated veterinary school i never want to be an owner i said all the things i'm sure you've heard uh, too many headaches i don't want to deal with the human resources aspect of it and you know fire people hire people manage people i just want to be a doctor and so i said never but the practice I met was really the right fit as far as the culture, the quality of medicine, the right number of veterinarians. We all valued having time away from work, travel, continuing education, and staying current. And so when the opportunity to buy into that practice and become a one-third partner came up, I'd already been nudged by my very astute financially father-in-law to, hey, why don't you own a practice? Huh. So I started thinking about it, looked into it further, and pretty much did like I've done a lot of things in life and just said, okay, and threw myself into it. And I've learned it, learn as I go. <laughs> so true for so many of us, I think. Yes. Um, the evolution of that, can you give a little more detail on the steps that happened on your journey? And, and maybe a little more detail about the practice as well. Yeah, so the, the practice at that time was a three to four doctor, pretty much three FTE, yep. full-time equivalent veterinary practice. And we had a fourth veterinarian we added within a year of that. But at that time, the it went down from two owners to one, and she did not want to practice alone. So my partner, Colleen, had always had the philosophy that she didn't want to be a solo owner and she wanted partners and to be that collaborative. So she helped us rather than us go for outside financing. She wanted us to run the clinic with her as a team, the three of us, Lauren is the other partner. So she financed us and we're an us corporation. So what we did was we just structured the ability. We knew we had the financial means to do it, that our dividend payment would be equal to our loan payment. So repaying the loan through dividend payment. Exactly. Is that right? So it benefited Colleen as well because she earned the interest off us. And it was easier for us too. If something, she's a very wonderful, supportive person so that if you had a, needed to skip a payment and add it on at the end, that was okay with her as well. And so she, um, this was, how, what year was this that the deal was done for you guys? So this was... 
The beginning of the talking about it and planning it was 2002. Yep. And 2003 is when we signed our papers and made it happen. Okay. And I'm thinking now and, and, and about whether that deal would have been possible now, given the sort of changed conditions. Was that a very values-driven thing that um, your owner wanted the legacy of the practice to be in independent hands and to help the next generation along? Do you think that sort of thing, would, would that have happened now? And does that happen much in the US? Is that going on? Or is there now such a pressure on multiples because of corporate buying that people look for the dollar and not so much for the succession of their existing team members? Exactly. I mean, that is something that I think about a lot and I talk to other practice owners about a lot. And at the time, what the practice grossed being able to buy a third of it was a doable thing. Yeah. You know, if you have to borrow uh, 150, $250,000 to buy into a practice. So then that was a lot of money. Now to buy my practice, the way it has grown and what it's going to be, I'm, I am the solo practice owner now. It, it, I, I have a hard time imagining one or two people doing it. They won't be able to borrow enough. And in, that's where the corporation buying happens. How much has your practice grown and what happened to your other partners along the way? Well, so when I bought in in 2003, from what the practice was grossing then to now, so 14 years later, we're, we've more than doubled the gross revenue that we had then. So we've just continued in a really good trajectory of growing steadily each year, even through recession Recessions, times. Yep, yep. So what's happened is that we long ago outgrew our current facility and we're practicing in a way too small three exam room practice. We do a, as much work as uh, we need six exam rooms. Right. When you do all the formulas and the industry standards. How many doctors do you have working for you now? So right now I have four doctors working for okay. me. And, and a relief one. Are you still engaged in the practice full-time or part-time? Part-time. So my, my two partners, we are all still so connected. They still work with me. Yeah. I, I, it's hard to say for me because to <laughs> me, they work with me still. Yeah. Yeah. And they're going to stay with the practice uh, for a number of years, right. as long as they want to, frankly. Yeah. And what happened was the need to go to the new facility and borrow, you know, to take out a million-dollar loan and go to a new facility, build it, wasn't the right fit. One is closer to retirement age. Yes. And the other one is just really at a phase in her career where she does not want to be a practice owner anymore. So it made more sense for, since I was driving this, to at the same time buy them out. Okay. So I'm going to have to ride that slide, just like you were, you were alluding to, yeah. of holding it down, holding the fort on my own. Potentially, I want my practice manager to buy in. Yes. So we're really going to work on her buying 10% of the business in the next year. I'm yeah. committed to that goal. Okay. But I would like to see the legacy of my two younger associates buy my share of the business, but I think it's going to have to be uh, digestible amounts, potentially buying 20% or 30%. Yeah. Uh, whether I finance them or they get outside financing, it can be up to them. Yeah. So, but I'd rather see that. I, I worry though, that if I don't encourage and foster that and enable it to happen, that I will be at a point in 10 to 20 years that the best solution is to sell the whole thing to a corporation. Yeah, okay. And question pops in my head there. So you are clearly still very, very passionate about what you do. And we're going to come on to the other areas of passion and interest that you have in a second. But what has kept you so passionate and fired up to want to invest the amount of time, the energy and money into building this practice and you still work in it? So the, I, I still love being a veterinarian. I, I like people and I like interacting with them. That helps a lot. <laughs> it does. And I've really found what's evolved in the, the community that I'm in. I've been stable in that community for 14 years. The connections I have to my clients now has really grown, which I also love. So I know them and see them outside and they're emotionally bonded to my practice too as part of the community. So I really love that. And what's got me fired up about the move really is the, I, I just get more excited each day about the things I can do better because part of our career is getting to evolve. Some of the things we did medically when I graduated, we don't do anymore. And just like that, my clinic will evolve to being able to be fear-free. 
and practice the way we know we should, have a dental suite with two sinks, so we can do two procedures rather than out in the treatment area type thing. So that's what's got me excited, is actually getting to practice the way I've been wanting to and knowing I need to. Um, that gives us a sort of pretty good overview then. So Karen's coming very much from the in independent owner, practitioner, um, operator point of view, um, sitting opposite her uh, in the blue corner. And it's not really, a, we're not, we don't want to set that up as a sort of uh, a boxing match. Um, but Kim, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us, tell us you know, your backstory now. We'll hand, the, hand the mic to you. Thank you. I'm also a veterinarian. Uh, I'm French-Canadian veterinarian, so um, my birth country is not the United States. Uh, but I uh, contemplated being a veterinarian since I was teeny tiny. Um, how, I, how, how young do you remember? Oh, it's like one of my very first thoughts. You know, <laughs> when you're really, really, really young, you want to be a hairdresser. I think all little girls at one point <laughs> want to be a hairdresser. Do all girls want to be a hairdresser? All boys want to be astronauts? Uh, at the very, <laughs> very, very beginning. I think I and wanted then, to be an astronaut, but my daughter wants to be a hairdresser. A hairdresser. <laughs> I've got two young girls, and that's what they talk about. Um, but then, you know, uh, reality struck, and uh, veterinary medicine was just one of those things. And so I just remember spending my weekends... Um, you know, taking all my, my teddy bears, all my plushes, and putting them on my bed and um, contemplating diseases or, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they weren't feeling well and I needed to fix them. And, um, and I was an only child, so I guess, you know, I had to entertain myself. Um, <laughs> and so it just, that's where it all began. Um, and, uh, and so when I got to SAJAP, uh, ultimately, my goal was, you know, to make sure that the courses that I was going to take were going to get me into veterinary medicine. Um, but that uh, costs money, and I was living on my own at that time. And this awesome opportunity came about for me to um, participate in a student job program with the government, and it was to work as a Canadian customs officer. And so I actually really, really loved that job and ended up working as a Canadian Customs Officer for almost 10 years. Uh, and it's what took me through SAGEP and my bachelor's degree and my master's degree and my doctorate's degree. Um, and so, you know, uh, totally random, different career for 10 years before ever being a veterinarian. I think there's a lot of questions like, I was tempted, you're probably bound by some official secrets act not, not to talk about some of the things you saw there. Are there any um, any interesting stories that you could share from that time? Uh, there's lots of interesting stories. I don't know if there's any that I can really share. But what I can tell you, though, is um, those 10 years of um, my career as a Canadian customs officer really molded, I think, my ability to uh, interact with uh, clients. Um, there was a lot of conflict management and a lot of uh, conflict resolution that had to transpire in that role. Um, you know, pe people don't like being told that they can't bring something in or that they illegally tried to and that you're seizing them today or that you're arresting them today. Um, so I, I really developed that skill set that I think when I became a veterinarian was one of the things that I see our new grads struggle most with is how to actually make that connection with the client, but then also gain that client's commitment and complacent right. um, to what you're asking them to do. And uh, so that was, I don't think, ever an issue for me. I never had any problem going in and saying, hey, this is what I need to do today with your, with your pet, and this is how much it's going to cost you. Um, so you know, that, there were a lot of valuable lessons from that career. Sticking with that for a second, what, what, what then are the most important elements of getting that veterinarians could take away and, and deliver a change about their style to have those sorts of outcomes, to make that an easy conversation? Because we, we do struggle with that. Um, I, why do we struggle and what would you, do diff what would you advise people to do differently? I agree with you that it is the biggest struggle. And I think fundamentally it's communication, communication skills. Um, we don't do a very good job in veterinary medicine. I mean, I graduated 12, 13 years ago, and I never had a communication class during my veterinary years. Nobody ever taught me. Uh, I thought I was going in to play with puppies and kittens all day long. Um, so, you know, 
what that career was able to provide me is those fundamental communication skills. You know, how to look somebody straight in the eye, you know, that firm handshake, that walking in with confidence of, okay, you, you, something was not right that you just did today, and we're going to talk about it. Uh, right. And we're going to talk about it in a way that I'm still going to be very respectful and still gain your trust. And in a lot of these scenarios, I often had clients hug me at the end and say, this, this wasn't a fun experience, yet you made it a good experience. Uh, so I think fundamentally for our new grads, the communication skills, if they can get some form of communication training, either outside of their veterinary degree, uh, that, that would be a number one uh, requirement, I requirement. think to be successful. Right, and, and what's coming across there was, you know, the, the confidence, the way that you sort of hold yourself in that moment. Uh, I'm curious, did you ever get any hugs from, in the border police role from having those conversations? I had, um, I had folks that I seized and would tell them if they wanted their items back, they needed to give me quite a significant amount of money that, in fact, hugged me or shook my hand and just said thank you. Uh, and and it was it was interesting because I think that's why I stayed with that career for so long, because when I got to um, uh, two years later, I wasn't a student. They didn't want me to stay as a student anymore. They wanted me to be there as a permanent, right? Which was amazing for me because that tripled my salary <laughs> and so many other benefits that came with it. And um, and they they knew all along. Ultimately, my goal was veterinary medicine and to be a veterinarian. And they tried to keep me in any way, shape, or form they could. You know, they 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 asked if I would want to be a dog handler. You know, that way I could marry both. And and when I got to the end, and I actually had my degree, and um, I told them, "Hey guys, I'm I'm graduating next week, and I have a job, and I'm going to be working for a veterinary practice." They didn't accept my resignation they you know they said can you stay on as locum because we just you know we just think that that this works yep. uh, and even when I left the country um, and so I you know I decided to leave the veterinary practice that I was at and start a whole new life for myself and my husband and we moved to Florida the furthest we could get where there was no snow uh, and no cold weather, uh, they actually said, hey, let's just, let's put you on a sabbatical and let's still keep you for a year. We'll call you in a year to find out if you still like it over there. And if not, you're welcome to come back. So I, I just, you know, I honestly loved it there. But what they brought me and the learnings I got from them, without them actually realizing, I think, that they gave me such great learnings, I, you know, I hold true to my heart. And you have um, you know, now a different pathway in your career, so entering veterinary medicine. Can you expand and talk about you know, what your role is now and your journey to get there? Yeah, in the early phases of my journey, I um, went through what probably several veterinarians have gone through in their career. And there was some compassion fatigue and there was some burnout. What, 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 Ill what induced those feelings for you? Uh, my personality, I mean, we're a type A, many of us are type A yeah. in uh, veterinary medicine. And I just, I loved everything I did. And um, and so I just wanted to do more. You know, I, I loved the veterinary practice I worked at. I loved the Canadian Customs Border uh, folks I worked with. You know, I considered all of them my family. So when they, when they would ask, I would say yes. Uh, and ultimately, at one point in time, it just led to me being extremely exhausted yep. and, and being extremely exhausting and not actually realizing I was extremely exhausted, you know, and, and um, thankfully for my husband, you know, the realization of, I used to see you more when you were going to vet school in another city. Yeah. And, um, and that hit home. What was, so this is something that I have sensed in myself looking back of getting very close to burnout but also having had no awareness of it at the time and I hear it from other colleagues what was your like so you obviously know you were approaching that how how is it you're able to say that now and if you were to be able to go back what were the warning signs of impending burnout that you could warn yourself of that's a great question 
I think if you're at a point where you're not taking care of yourself anymore and everybody else comes first, uh, that would probably be sign number one. Uh, it, sure, it certainly was for me. I mean, I, and I have a tendency to still do that. So the self-awareness piece of it, uh, there is often that guilty pleasure if I take time for myself. And I've got two girls and I've got a, a fantastic husband. Um, but it often, often I will tell myself, oh, you know, that, that 30 minutes of like going to the gym could be 30 minutes where I'd be home with my girls and they don't see me often. And, you know, so I have a tendency to have that little uh, cassette player, Trash talk in you your know, head. in my head. Yeah. Um, but I think the self-awareness is important. Yeah. Uh, but it, it comes to, you know, if you are not prioritizing yourself first, you, you need to take a step back. How do you, so the self-awareness is step one. Do you have any routines or habits or strategies you employ now to manage that sort of self-talk? Yeah, I, I tell a lot of people. Um, I <laughs> Does tell that a make lot you of people, accountable? <laughs> well, I tell a lot of people because then people um, can tell me when I'm not doing what I should be doing. Uh, which is the number one. So I think if you surround yourself with people that you really trust, that um, that are great resources, that understand what it all means, then then the, with a very kind heart, they'll say, hey, T, I don't think you're doing what you said you'd be doing. Yeah. Uh, and they, they, they remind you of those things. Where did you find those people and how do you find those people? So I actually think what you said there is super, extremely powerful but the question that might be on people's mind is okay but I, I don't have any of those people in my life and there's nobody necessarily that I can trust that much because you're effectively doing something that's very vulnerable mm-hmm. um, so where did you find those people and how could we advise people on that um, I don't know if I found them some may have found me and um, in other scenarios I think I've just been open to finding them myself uh, when I when I started uh, this journey where we moved to Florida, I started with Banfield, and the only reason I chose uh, that hospital in particular was because of my interaction with the owner who interviewed me. I had had several other interviews during that week that we were down here, and um, most which led to an offer, but he actually took me to lunch. And he shared a very, very personal story with me around cancer that he had faced, um, kind of came out of nowhere, wasn't expecting it, was in remission, and was just kind of sharing how precious life was. And I didn't know this guy. I mean, I had met him the night before <laughs> for my interview and was doing the day, the, the following day, was doing this in-person interview with him uh, or observation working interview and he takes me to lunch and he shares that story so it was kind of like "Mm, I could really work for this guy you know he has values very similar to mine and I hadn't felt that with the other owners the other folks that had interviewed me so that's really the only reason why I chose to go work for Banfield and and it was so funny because we got on a plane and we flew back and my husband and I were super excited and we were celebrating and then my husband went on went on the internet and started searching Banfield and it was like, ooh, honey, you know, some of the things they're saying about this, this, this <laughs> corporation. And I was like, you know what, I don't care. I don't care because, because I trust him. And it was the best decision I ever made. I mean, I'm still with them 12 years later. Amazing. And I think value, values is something we could circle around and I, I would like to pick both your brains on that. Um, but so what do you do now for Banfield um, and how long has it taken you to move through the organization to get to that position? Yeah, so right now I'm the vice president of veterinary quality and um, I'm responsible for an entire region, the Midwest region, which has over 145 hospitals uh, and nine, nine separate markets. So I currently have nine medical directors that report to me. Um, and then all the doctors that report to them also report to me, but, you know, there's, a, there's um, them in the middle. Uh, and I started in 2006 as an associate doctor, and about a year later had an opportunity to transfer to the practice side. 
uh, and began as a chief of staff in a very, very busy hospital. It was about an hour away from my home, so it was a pretty extensive drive, but I loved it and I got tons of learnings. I had never been a leader. Um, and so, you know, when they proposed that, I thought, well, sounds interesting, sounds challenging. I like new challenges, you know, let's, let's try this. Um, and about a year later, they said, hey, we're opening something really, really close to your house, about 10, 15 minutes, brand new hospital. Do you want to go there? And I thought, heck yeah, it's 15 minutes from my house. But I, I don't know anything about a new hospital. I don't know how to get new clients. I don't, what, what, is, what is that? <laughs> and, you know, they were like, don't worry about it. We'll, you know, we'll teach you everything you need to know. We'll show you everything you need to know. You'll have all the support you need. And, uh, and, and I did. And um, we actually became profitable after nine months of being open. I had two associates. From, from New Start. Mm -hmm. It's an amazingly yeah, fast from a new start. I had two associate doctors with me. So we were three docs. And I had a fantastic uh, practice manager. And um, we had this model uh, back in the day with the practice where you could be a partner doctor. So it was kind of like being an owner, but you actually didn't have to invest. Uh, but from a, a profit sharing standpoint, you did get some of the profit shares. Yep. Um, and you could do 100% or you could do a 75-25. And my practice manager was talking to me about doing the 25%. I totally agreed with her. And when we did after, uh, you know, when we got profitable after nine months, um, she hadn't gotten the official title yet, but we got, um, we got a really nice surprise and we got a bonus because of that. And they gave me 100% of the bonus. And so I just calculated 25%, wrote her a check for the 25%. And I think from there, um, she was, you know, forever grateful. Um, There's and that trust thing again. That trust thing again, right? She was forever grateful, and that's kind of where, for me, there, it, it sort of clicked, you know, what leadership really, really means. Um, and, uh, and I went on maternity leave, and I came back from maternity leave, and there was a medical director position that was opening up. And my field director uh, came over and said, hey, I really think you should apply to this. And I thought, well, he's crazy <laughs> because I'm, you know, what, six years out at this point, you know, five years out. I don't, I don't know everything. I don't, I haven't seen every single medical case out there. I haven't seen any, every surgical case out there. I certainly can't be a medical director. Um, and he said, no, he said, you have that emotional intelligence and that's what great leadership is about. It doesn't matter if you have all the technical skills. So I, I was like, okay, well, hey, you know, what could happen? Nothing, right? I can apply, not get it, no big deal. I still love every day what I do. Uh, and I actually ended up getting the position. And I, and I shared with Karen yesterday, I got the position and the salary they gave me was the same salary I was making. <sighs> And I didn't negotiate it because <laughs> I was just so stoked <laughs> that somebody actually gave me the job yeah. that I was like, yes, yes, yes. When can I start? So are we outlining, and I'm going to ask you a question in a second about what are the challenges that women in, in veterinary medicine are facing. But the two that came across there were, you know, imposter syndrome and not valuing yourself. Are they, are they two things that are on the list yeah. that you've just oh, yeah. ably yeah. demonstrated? <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely accurate. And it's what Karen and I and Sarah have had a chance to present on. Uh, last year, we presented on imposter syndrome. This year, we actually presented on the wage gap um, and our inability to negotiate because we don't oftentimes know our worth. And the flip side of if you're on the side where the associate is negotiating with you, say you're the manager or you're the owner, uh, we also wanted to talk about being fair because with, with gender bias in those types of negotiations, we, we, they, they pop right in and you have no idea, but you will bristle potentially at a female associate requesting a salary raise and not as much for a male associate because we have this And that's automatic as a female owner. Or a female manager, is that right, on the other Correct. side? Correct, yeah. yes. And we have that mental image that he's the breadwinner, when often that's shifting nowadays. So we also tried to give some tools to be more objective, check your biases, make your reviews be more 
equivocal. So can you populate out the list of the things that women face that are struggle that you are observing and you've seen and like what what is that list and let's let's narrow it down because I'm sure we could talk forever and <laughs> you guys have got important other stuff you've got to do so what are the top three or four issues that you know let's 80 20 it like wh- what are the 20 percent of things that are causing 80 percent of the problems for women in leadership right now go ahead Karen for me the number one is probably confidence and it probably is all new graduate veterinarians face a confidence issue but it's more in in pronounced in women and we're graduating more women veterinarians so part of that I think you'll read about the hidden curriculum in the veterinary schools so part of that is the way we train we're trained to worry that we're going to make a mistake we're trained at places where they're bringing the mistakes the animal that couldn't get better at the general practitioner is coming in it's got the more complicated diagnosis and treatment so we go out with less confidence so I think we do need to be training for for, specifically for confidence, but we are wired to question ourselves and go into what we're doing with less confidence. And if you have less confidence, it just eats away at so many other things and makes you work harder to be more perfect, which then gets you burnout. Like the, it just, it's a domino effect for me. What about you? I would agree with Karen. Confidence certainly number one. I think the other t- the other one is um, we try to be superheroes. Right. You know, in in um, in our minds again with that perfectionism. You know, we want to be the great doctor that doesn't ever make any mistakes. We want to be the great mom. You know, the 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 perfect mom that's in the magazines. Uh, <laughs> we want to be the great wa- in the magazines well, exactly as well, right. It? We want to be the great wife. Um, we want to have the great body. So you know, we we got to get some workout in there, uh, and so we just we just we try to be these superheroes, when in reality we don't need to be superheroes. The whole can you do it all? Like we we have a hard time recognizing that no, we can't do it all at once. Yeah, and letting go. Yes. Letting go. You know, I have, I am so, 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 so thankful for my husband. Um, when we, when we moved to Florida, he, um, um, became dependent on my work visa. And so that meant for him that he had to take a pause in his career, which he was quite content and happy to do. Um, and, uh, it actually gave me the opportunity to, to make my way to where I am today, because I don't know if I would have been as brave as I was to say yes to all these opportunities, if I had to also think about, you know, my two girls at home and and everything else. Whereas, you know, when the medical director opportunity came up and they said, hey, there's gonna be traveling and there might be some nights where you're not at home, no problem. My husband is gonna be there for my girls. When the regional medical director position came down the line five years later and they said, hey, how, you're- How old are your girls at that point? Um, my girl, when I first became a medical director, my, my big girl was six months old. Right. Um, when I became a regional medical director, uh, my baby was uh, about two years old. Right. Um, and so they've always seen mommy in, in this form, yeah. so it's not any different for them. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of traveling. There's a, there's a lot of sacrificing you know my baby took her first steps and started walking and I was at a at a national field leadership conference and so I got it through a video yeah. on my phone thankfully my husband was there for it so yes. so I, I think um, I think you've got to f- figure out what you can let go and what you're okay letting go I had to let go of the laundry I had to let go of the house cleaning you know there's a certain level of OCD oh, yeah. I suffer from and <laughs> uh, that took time uh, but if I didn't do that, then I found myself, you know, spending my weekends doing that trivial nonsense versus getting on the ground with my girls and, you know, playing Barbies. But the other theme I hear when Kim talks is the one that helps women a lot is being nudged. And she was nudged. Someone said to her, you should apply for this. You'd be good at it. And I think women need that a lot more than men do. Actually, there's data behind that. And so in leadership that I'm involved in, like with AVMA and my state leadership, 
and speaking for the Women's Veterinary Leadership Initiative and helping get that started, really that is one of the biggest things I realized that I wasn't doing well and I needed to do more of is, you can call it a nudge, you can call it sponsorship, but was to, to cast the net, to see an opportunity and realize that they weren't necessarily, other women I knew that would be good at that weren't stepping up and saying, raising their hand and saying, oh, I'll do it, that I needed to say, hey, and give them the little push from behind. You should try this. What what can I do to convince you? And I I do that all the time now. I absolutely agree with that. Okay. Can I ask you, you're both highly successful, high res- highly respected in the industry. Um, have you experienced and felt imposter syndrome along the way? Every yes. day? <laughs> Every single day. And Every day? I, and I will put my hat in the ring here. I, this is, I don't think this is a, a female-only thing. No, and it's I'm quite not. happy to say, like, same for me. So, and that, that's powerful. I want to ask, I, I you know, suspected the answer might be what it was. But people listening, like, it's, like, we're made to be this, you know, this perfect thing on a pedestal as a veterinarian and we've worked hard and we've all succeeded and then that that feels like failure when you feel like you're an imposter right you can't do that so you're right it's it is universal and it and it comes with highly successful people so the more successful you are the more you achieve the more pressure you feel that that you're going to be found out find out right right and if you find out you're not good enough and you find out nobody will love you right the end <laughs> it's all over the end <laughs> um is imposter syndrome a, an essential part of the voyage of breaking through to something on the other side or is it a byproduct is it a byproduct of that process uh, of you know growth you have to push yourself and challenge yourself to move beyond a, a comfort level so you're always going to feel like oh, i can't do this job as you rattle around in the new big plant pot right is it a natural part of that? Is it something that, rather than say it's a bad thing, should we be embracing it and dancing with it and saying, Look, if you're not feeling this, there's some, you're, something wrong there? Well, then there is actually an opposite of imposter syndrome, <laughs> which is when you think you know a lot, but you don't know anything. Narcissistic. Um, yes, it's a, there's a name for it, Dunning-Kruger Do- effect. I, was, I thought Dunning you were going to call it Donald Trump effect exactly. for a second there. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think you're right, and I think once... What, what, what anyone listening can take home is the aha moment of I'm not the only one that feels that way and being able to look around and know that 90% of the people you're interacting with probably feel the same way and owning it and saying, you know, of course, I know so the reason I know there's so much I don't know is because I know so much. You know, the more you know, the more you know you don't, don't know. know. Right, right. And so, yes, owning it and knowing that others are as caught up, they're, they're more caught up in themselves than thinking about you and that they are also feeling the same way it has definitely helped me because I'll, I'll call people on it that I work with like, nope, you're just, that's your imposter sy- syndrome voice. What can, you, what can we do? I'll catch myself and, and I'll say out loud, well, there I go. And so it's, I think it's, it's a strength. It's fear at the end of the day, it isn't right. it? It's fear. It's it is fear. It's fear that you're going to get found out. What are the other things that are we go back to that 80 20 of things that are affecting progress of female leadership um what are the other things on that list we've got imposter syndrome we've got um confidence so i want to circle back to you mentioned confidence and what the question i was going to ask you was how do you build confidence like if we have a you know this hidden agenda that's that's it's hardwiring a lack of confidence into graduates how do we go about fixing that like what do you need to do to become confident and and you know from a veterinary school perspective how do we stop that happening but for people that have graduated that can relate to this what can they practically do to build confidence now well i think the first thing um, to do is to really surround yourself with folks that can be mentors and i think that mentorship piece uh, it held a lot for me in my career and i'm sure for karen as well um the the know your worth piece and sometimes you don't know it until somebody tells you and that's usually a great mentor and then the next thing is you know to build from that we have to constantly look at ourselves from a growth and development you know it doesn't stop once you get your veterinary degree and so find the type of um, 
conferences, type of lectures where you can learn some of that skill set around how do I uh, project myself as more confident? What are some tips? What are some tricks? You know, what does leadership, what does good leadership look like so that you can then help yourself along as well with the support of those mentors? I think with the veterinary education, what we can do is incorporate a little bit more of the one-on-one communication skills, the exam room, sit down and talk, how to listen. We, we teach our veterinarians how to take a history, but we don't get really specific and talk about open-ended questions, right. listening, repeating what the client said to you. So those things later. And the other thing we can do to help Uh, people who've already graduated, I think, is especially if we're in the position of being their manager or the owner of the practice that they're working in, is to remember to tell them what they did right. Because, and and, and for yourself, instead of at night replaying the day and focusing on the things that that didn't go well, the case that that you couldn't figure out, try to remind yourself of the three things that went well and, and you can reframe into a more positive, confident uh, way that mind fret set Ch- choose to live in a beautiful state not a suffering state is the way I've heard it described from sort of Indian Buddhist sort of background point of view like we put ourselves through so much self-induced suffering yes and as perfectionists we just flog ourselves over yeah. those little details and I had one conversation over lunch here where um, no names but somebody was flogging themselves over a relatively minor detail and yeah. said, well, you know, what, what's good? What can you take out of that that was good, though? And then initially there was like, oh, what do you mean? <laughs> and then, the, then it became, well, it's grudgingly almost, well, I suppose I learned that I can do this differently and I need to fix that problem and so it doesn't happen again and blah. And like, well, you got yeah. something good out of it then, right? Yeah, I think there's, um, there's a lot of value in, um, one, finding out what your strengths are. And if you don't know asking or even doing some of the um, strength tests that are out there you know strength finder is a great is a ha- great resource you have any specific ones uh, strength, strength finder, finder yeah that's the one that I've done in the past yep. and the beauty of that book when you actually read that book what it talks about is exactly what Karen was saying is a lot of times when we have performance reviews or we have development conversations with our associates it's always about the things you're not skilled at or the opportunities you have and how you get better at those. Reality is, it's probably going to be an opportunity for me for the rest of my life. No matter how much I work on it, it might be maybe a little less of an opportunity, but it's always going to be something I'm going to revert to um, in times of hardship or in times of challenge. And instead, why not look at what are your strengths? Right. And from that approach, really continue to use those strengths to power through and surround yourself with folks that have different strengths that might be for you some of your opportunities uh, and and really excel at that piece. And so that book to me was really eye-opening because we do development conversations at our practice and we do performance reviews and we do development plans. And it was always looked at from the approach of what are the opportunities. And now, you know, when I did this three years ago, I've turned those conversations around to where, hey, let's look maybe at, maybe you do have opportunities that could be career stallers for you. So perhaps we do need to look at those. But let's also look at what are some of your strengths. And is there a way for us to use that strength even more for you? And then connect you with somebody that might be able to balance out that opportunity that you have because it's a strength of theirs and in a you have a lot more mobility i guess within the banfield structure that you have to be able to pair people up and match people and move them around is that program that you actively are deploying and and something you've you've pursued yeah everybody in our practice has a development plan in place it's um one of those mars uh standards you know gold standards and i think it's absolutely phenomenal And then you asked Karen earlier about her passion and why she keeps doing what she does. To me, what my passion has become has been the development, the development aspect, how I can take uh, any associate, and certainly 90% of our associates are women, so that's great, uh, because we need more women leaders in the profession, um, 
but it's being able to really hone in to what are your career aspirations? What do you want to become when you grow up? And how can I get you there? And then for me, they're my clients now. So the clients that you speak to that bring in pets every day, my clients are the people I serve every day. And it's such a beautiful thing to see them grow in their career, take on leadership positions, become medical directors. Even um, if they leave the practice and they go and open their own private practice, just seeing how they have molded into something extraordinary is the reason why I continue to do what I do and why I get up every day. I think there's nothing better than seeing somebody you've mentored blossom and bloom into something that they once upon a time maybe didn't even believe they could be. And how it betters the profession. Yeah. You know, it's not just for Banfield, but it's how it betters the profession. I, you know, because of Karen, I, I now um, have the, the you know, opportunity to be a board member of the WVLDI, the Women Veterinary Leadership Development Initiative. And so again, you know, Uh, more opportunity throughout the profession to just help build upon some of that leadership skill set because it is missing in our practice and we just have to get these resources out there. Um, I want to pick up on the leadership because that's one of these nebulous terms that certainly I struggled to get clarity on what that actually meant despite having read umpteen books. It was really a practice of almost getting it wrong for a long while and working out well that that's not working that's not working for them that's not working for me and found it hard to gain clarity and that's something that I've worked hard on to try and establish some clarity so I'm curious as to what would I'm not really looking for a definition of leadership but more the activities of a leader um, what things should we be focusing on um, as leaders that are important that we, you know, our toolkit that we are utilizing every day and deploying in practice. I also struggle to define it too and particularly I think the first time someone called me a leader I was looking around like who are you, <laughs> Your who are you talking to? Kingdom. Yes, exactly. <laughs> me? I'm a leader and for me it's being w- willing to take risks and do something that's out of your comfort zone in leadership, when I say leadership roles, in volunteering. A lot of the times, the what I think of leader opportunities are volunteer, whether it's on my local school board, saying, okay, yes, I'm gonna run, and getting on the local school board, which I recently did. Um, it can, so in your community, stepping up to those, and then you are in a leadership position, you realize that if you're on the school board, you are making decisions with others, that are going to impact a lot of people. Yeah. So that activity, any of the organized veterinary medicine activities, that some of them can be more frustrating than others, but I find that I love it and I encourage a lot of people to volunteer for those because you are stepping into, you're taking our profession, and I, I always tell people that as soon as you got your veterinary degree, that's, that made you a leader. You are leading people through a decision process. You are leading a team down a diagnostic path and a treatment path. You are a leader as soon as you get your veterinary degree, whether you like it or not. And from there though, how can you represent the profession well out in the world? And whether it's legislation, keeping a, a veterinarian's voice in government and things like that, I think those are important and I want more people to become leaders just by their activity of volunteering and stepping up and giving it a try. You can always quit if it doesn't work. Do people have to be in a management role to be a leader? I don't think so. I don't think so either. And and as I was listening to you talk, Karen, it is very true what you just said. And um, to me, leader doesn't equate to any kind of title whatsoever. It's, you know, it's not a fancy title. It's not being the boss of somebody. It's being a leader to me looks like servant leadership. I am here for you. And how can I provide impact? How can I influence? How can I bring purpose back into your life? And so you got to meet the individual where the individual is at. uh, And you've got to be able to understand how are they doing and where could you make a difference for them and and that piece is hard that's not always easy 
Um, and so I, I think to me, that's it's not about a title. It's not about who you are. It's not about all the things you've accomplished. It's really just kind of getting down and dirty and how can I make a difference for you? Because we can make a difference with anybody. Are there specific strategies as or tactics as leaders that, that you employ each day that you found very valuable to you? Um, for me, I've always, um, I, I've read a lot about the different uh, styles of leadership, types of leadership, you know. So when you talk about servant leadership, there's that understanding where the individual is at in their growth. You know, are they... Um, in the beginnings where they need you to be a little more directive with them or are they um, in a very comfortable zone where you need to be more hands-off because if you're more direct with them you're going to disengage them so there's tools of that nature that I think uh, are good for anybody that wants to understand leadership more. Are there any particular books or resources that you've encountered that have helped you? I, I've read a million books. I, the ones that stick to to me, um, you know, Start With The Why from Simon Sinek has been a huge influencer. Book, yeah. Influencer actually has been a really, really good book uh, just to help um, with how to motivate teams. Yeah. Um, and then there's, you know, Crucial Accountability. There's uh, there's so many out there that you can really um, uncover ways to modify your leadership to be able to have an impact. Karen, any any books that jump out of your mind that have been helpful for your, your development? Uh, I'm one of those people who tends to read the first couple chapters and then skip to the end. <laughs> I'll confess. So, um, All about the bread, no filling. And and I'll have like six books going at the same time. So there's not one that jumps out (laughs) as as a big one to read. But um, No books on focus then. uh, uh, There's one though that I read that was interesting to me called Leadership and the Sexes. Just because the more Mm. I've thought about gender issues and paid attention to, to differences... That book actually uses science, which we like evidence-based. So it does use like brain scans and data on why uh, men will be a tendency to uh, act in one way and women in other in leadership and how they interact actually. And so I do like that one just because it's uh, informative. Are there any other burning issues that you would like to highlight as, as potentially problematic for women in leadership? One of the biggest challenges, and so if we talk about getting more women to be in leadership roles, like Kim's career, one of the biggest challenges is something that she basically alluded to, is having the ability to do that and take care of everybody else. And it's not easy, and so it is a much, it takes a lot more work for a woman, especially if she has a family, frankly, to be able to do those things away from home, time away from home leadership opportunities. And that's just sort of a society problem. And I don't have a solution for it, unfortunately. Both of you have um, families. And so you found a way through that. Um, Can we know that um, certainly for the early part of your career, that was your husband taking a sabbatical. Karen, how did you find your way through that? And I, I was actually, I was very, it really jumped out at me what you said there is, a lot of us label childcare as the thing that stops women. You actually said something I thought was very interesting there, and it was was just the care generally. Right. The role of care generally. Which I, and maybe that's my being a being a man, <laughs> hadn't <laughs> well, really we, considered it like that, but that's a fascinating insight. I think so too, because I think women that don't have children also have this uh, issue because they potentially, they're, well, they're you, if they're in a relationship, they're taking care of that person. They're taking care of coworkers or friends in ways, emotional support, um, doing things for them. And then it, throw in there a sick parent or an elderly parent that you have to take care of. So there's just so many barriers that we can, roadblocks that we can put right up and that we have to go through. And so I think it's the taking care of everyone else that that gets in our way. And if we acknowledge that that we need to part that and partition it, I guess. Yeah. And it's hard to do. I, I how do I don't think I navigate it gracefully. My I do have a wonderful husband who is home taking care of our two children when I'm here at a conference. 
but it's not but he, always he easy. Works. He works. He works. As a yes, rule. he's gone he, through our time together. He's gone back to school. He's worked, and we've had the kids and just and so you've juggle. Fa- you've found a way to make that happen. Was it easier because you were a business owner? Um, in having that flexibility in a way that as an assistant associate veterinarian it's a little harder because you don't have the control to an extent I definitely am more able to do the travel the volunteer type things because I'm an owner yep. so I can be one of the decision makers to say this is when I'm going to work and this is when I'm not so there's more autonomy and um, more ability to say this is a priority and it's why I'm going to be away from work or not at the practice as a veterinarian right. for those times. So yes, it is definitely easier. Um, I wanted to change tack ever so slightly, uh, very subtly, and just ask you one question and then a follow-up question. What drives the gender bias that we see in veterinary medicine in, in your experience or in your knowledge? And a sort of a, a part two-ish is, so we have, I wonder if there's... You know, we, we we like to blame, and when I say we, I mean practice owners, the majority of which are male, mm-hmm. um, find it easy to blame that gender bias for the reason that it's hard to hire associates because all, not all, but many, many women are going to have babies. That's going to cut their career short. I have, I find that a challenging thing to say simply because I think that's it's very easy to point the finger of blame out and, and that's that's a blame. It's the same way as blaming the colleges for you know, having a poor intake policy and they're too smart and not sharp enough in their EQ. And it's the same as saying, oh, well, millennials just don't want to work as hard as we did mm-hmm. back in the day. I don't like that because it's finger pointing out and I have the suspicion that the problem lies with the leadership and the jarring contrast between male and female leadership styles or interactive styles that we're not addressing very well might be the greater problem and the reason for our churn rate. The first question is what causes the gender bias and the second thing is how much do you feel is the shortage of experienced vets and technicians, nurses is due to that gender bias and how much is it due to other factors? You know I was listening to what Karen was saying earlier about how um, being a practice owner has given her additional opportunities. And and in all honesty, I think um, it goes back to knowing your worth and knowing what kind of difference or what kind of impact you can make in the profession or in the lives of the folks that you would serve. So I think we just have to be a little more riskier. I think we have to break through those barriers. You know, as life went on, my husband certainly works now, and we had to look at it from the perspective of, okay, here's what I do and here's what it looks like. What do you want to do and what will that look like? And now let's break through the barriers to make sure we can both do things that make us happy. And oftentimes I think women, uh, I believe women are the ones that are causing this bias. Right. <laughs> because right. I, I think we're the ones that reinforce it because not once has my husband ever said, no, you need to stay at home, you're a mom. No, you've got kids. He's the one that's actually pushed me towards, hey, if that's what you want to do, if that's what you're passionate about, if that's what you love, then we're all in together. So I think oftentimes women internalize it and they cause the bias and reinforce the bias because they will say, no, I can't do this because I have to care for my children. Because, And so what I would like to see more and more of is practice owners, leaders in corporate medicine, helping women actually think outside of the box and break through those barriers and say, okay, what would it look like for me to be able to do this? Let's do a little root cause analysis and let's figure out a way. And so do the practice owners have to have a different approach? Do we as um, corporate medicine have to have a different approach where we actually encourage it and we encourage ways to think outside of the box so that women so we can change that recording that's out there and so women can start saying yes I can instead of no I can't right and some of the gender bias that I see is well 
gender biases are just our shortcuts and where we just automatically our brain has a connection to thinking of say a female veterinarian or a female staff member should be warm and fuzzy and softer spoken and say please thank you instead of just being direct and we had a skit thing we did yesterday where yes. it's uh, apologizing. We're always apologizing. Oh, I'm sorry. Someone bumps into you and you say, I'm sorry to them. So That's also a very British thing. <laughs> and Canadian. <laughs> and Canadian. <A> Canadian. <laughs> so we, with those biases, so we make an assumption. So I have people, and I do it myself. So catching myself now that I'm aware, back to when I was talking about nudging or thinking of someone in an opportunity, oh, but she just had a baby. Mm -hmm. That does not mean she might not want to do it. Right. Uh, same thing with practice ownership. Uh, I have veterinarians tell me none of their associates want to buy their practice. And I say, well, have you asked? Well, they haven't exactly asked. They've assumed that, well, this one's a young mom. This one's this way. Um, even the ones who don't have kids could get the mommy penalty. So it, it's those things and recognizing them that, that we are doing them and catch ourselves and, and stop it, frankly. Yeah, because every time we do it, we reinforce the bias versus actually getting rid of the bias. It's amazing hearing you talk about how focused you are on what you want and then finding a way to make that happen, whereas a lot of people are focused on what they don't want. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's a very veterinary problem, isn't it? Because we're problem solvers, so we always focus on the away from thing. Mm -hmm. But what's coming across in this conversation is both of you have been very focused on what I, what I do want, making that happen, and then found that way, had that will to make that happen. So you guys are doing a lot of speaking and presenting at the shows, which is awesome. And I'm guessing your sessions, I'm not guessing because I've seen them being stowed out and, and very interactive and uh, engaging. Um, what, are the, what are the common questions that you're getting asked? What's the, the audience reaction to those and what are the questions you're getting asked that are t really hitting home? A lot of when we talk about the biases or things that women, veterinarians particularly, are dealing with at work, a lot of the qu questions and then the afterwards questions tend to revolve around people wanting to talk through how they can make something at work better, often with how the women employees are treating each other. And so I think we both care a lot about trying to get women to recognize that they're not always treating each other well in the veterinary workplace. So that, that can contribute to your daily frustration, so, such as maybe technician not respecting a doctor and being more respectful to the male doctor that owns the practice than to the female associate veterinarian I had a, and the practice manager not navigating and making that a better interaction. Okay, are there any other things or behaviors that, that you would say are commonplace? Or you, you have a sense of that? Mm, I don't I think that's the number one you know when people come and see us after our presentations most of the time it starts off with thank you yep. thank you for talking about this yep. and then next comes the question of <laughs> here's what I'm dealing with and what do you recommend uh, so the beauty of it is you know people are talking about it um, the not so beautiful thing about it is it's still happening quite a bit so how do we influence even more okay um, and what's the answer to that question? They just got to keep coming. They got to keep coming <laughs> to some of these CBCs. They got to keep coming to see Karen, Sarah, and I. Uh, and then, you know, we, we were joking last year after our CBC, our th we did the three CBCs last year. And after our last one, we were saying, you know, we need to start going outside the United States. <laughs> we need to start sharing our message everywhere. And, I, and quite honestly, I think that's the more we talk about it, the more people are open to talking about it, don't feel isolated, don't feel like they're the only ones. And I think that's how we can make a true change. I'll have to hook you up with some of the uh, organizations in the UK. So if anyone from the BSAVA is listening yes. or the BVA or some of the larger corporate groups, you know, with CVS and Vets Now, you know, large female uh, em employers, then... Um, then the girls here are available for hire. We'll get on a plane and come talk about <laughs> this stuff for you guys, right? Sure. <laughs> awesome. All right, so let's um, we usually wind things up with some short form questions. And you can give long or short answers to these. Um, so I, I'm, and I'm just going to throw out a, a, a couple of them here. And you know what? I'm going to ask this, these two because I think they're pertinent. Because when you ask men these questions, they can give 
I've noticed they give quicker, easier answers. You ask ladies these questions, then I've noticed they've struggled so far. Okay. The first thing is, what are each of your superpower? Superpower. I do struggle with that question. <laughs> I think we all struggle with that question. Uh -huh. Well, maybe the question is, why do we struggle with that question? Or, or why, why yeah, are you struggling with Yeah, I'm just sitting question? here. Th what is it? What am I best at? Or what am I really good at? Or I, So I'm thinking of it in an activity. So I, I, yeah, it's a tough question. So I'll tell you, when I did uh, Strength Finders, my number one strength was individualization. Okay. Which I thought was absolutely fascinating. Mm. And when I actually read the description of individualization, I was like, wow, uh, it totally describes me. Uh, and it's all about being able to assess individuals. So really, um, you know, you spend a short amount of time with someone, yet you absolutely understand what their strengths are and what their opportunities are. And so it's that ability to really be able to connect and That's your emotional intelligence. Exactly. So I, I um, over the years, I've kind of continued to foster that more and more because, hey, it's a strength. So might as well. Uh, it seems to be know, working for you. Right. So uh, I would say that that's the piece that I um, think if you asked folks, what is my superpower? They'd say she can really understand you and know you and figure you out at times when you don't know yourself yeah right okay. i think i have the only superpower i can come up with is sort of joking but uh is swearing i'm very good at swearing <laughs> <laughs> very good at it Guy was speaking good. to me and my, my swear box that is stuffed full of dollars at this point yes. which i'm very grateful for everyone that's put some money in there it's not all just me swearing uh you you will cause me no offense in that being your answer that's for sure um What's your kryptonite? What do you suck at? Confrontation. I have oh, a hard. Oh, there's the that thing. One, say, so, and I got that answer so much faster. Mm. Um, confrontation and confronting someone with uncomfortable news or negative feedback uh, is is kryptonite. Yep. Yeah, there's a few things that I, there's several things that I'm not good at. Um, I am extremely passionate. There's a lot of passion in my blood in my cells and so sometimes when I'm there's something that I'm extremely passionate about I can become emotional which interestingly enough many many years ago one of my leaders told me you're never going to be anything because you're too emotional and people are going to see that vulnerability and they are never going to think of you as a good leader and so, you know, fast forward several years later, I had a uh, another leader, an absolutely fantastic leader. And um, I was struggling with that component as I was, you know, trying to move my career to the regional medical director. And he sat in the car with me and he said, you know what, T, the reason you are where you are now is because of that passion. So whatever they told you in the past is BS. Keep that passion it's yeah. who you are it's what gets folks connected to you it's that vulnerability piece that the people you serve see which makes them realize you're not a superhero and they possibly could be a leader as well yeah. um, so that's the piece that I, I have to um, you know be self-aware of it I have to moderate it at times and then at other times I just unleash it completely <laughs> which that could be a little scary for some <laughs> And you sort of answered the next quick fire question, which what, what's the uh, worst piece of advice you've ever received? Which <laughs> that was a pretty like bad one. That was right. Yeah. Um, that was a really bad one. And it took me back several years because I thought to myself, well, that's it. Like, I just, I guess I'm just going to be an associate doctor all my life. If you, this is a question for both of you. If you could go back in time to the day you graduated, give yourself one piece of advice, what would that piece of advice be? I would tell myself to chill out and it's actually going to all be okay because I did not know that and that it was going to be okay, that I was going to get more confident, that I was not going to kill every animal that I possibly tried to treat. And I would have told myself to chill out because in the first few years, I worked myself emotionally and mentally too hard. 
yeah, that should probably be something I would tell myself. <laughs> um, it, I think what I would tell myself is just keep dreaming. I mean, the sky is the limit. And, I, and I, a lot of times I've stopped dreaming thinking, okay, this is as far as I can go. But it's not. So look out for a new Banfield CEO in the next couple of years. <laughs> oh, no signs of things. Yeah. President, for sure. <laughs> CMO. Yeah. Yeah. I think... Um, there's lots of possibilities. Fantastic. Um, what book would you say anybody interested? So we've talked about some of the, you know, the leadership books you find useful. But what book would you recommend somebody? And, and, and it doesn't matter too much if it's female or male here. But what book would you recommend somebody read now who is managing, interested in managing, leading? Um, or running event practice, what's the one book that they should they should really grab with them and read before they start that journey? If they want to become a practice owner, and I don't know, honestly, I there's some really good ones out there, and I mostly have just learned on the fly, so <laughs> I, I can't refer to one yet. I, I don't know if I have one in particular. I think there are a multitude. And, and I think it goes back to what are you really good at and where do you maybe have some opportunities? Uh, because if you're really good at crucial conversations, then crucial conversations is not the book for you. Right. But if you're not good at that, you're going to need, you're gonna need, need, <laughs> you're gonna that, book. need that book. <laughs> um, and then I'd say, you know, one of the books that has impacted me the most, and it's not even a leadership book, but my husband at one point in time bought me this tiny little book, and I've given it to a lot of my veterinarians over the years, and it's Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. Right. It's a little, little book. It's, it's, a, it's a super funny book. It's really easy. You could read it in one evening. But it just puts things into perspective. And at one point in time, I think everybody in their career needs that book. I will say a book that someone just gave me recently that is also super short um, and extremely practical and applicable to most people who would listen to this is uh, Do Not Reply All. And <laughs> it's, um, a, it's a book That's on smart. email, email communication. <laughs> And email, and it, it, it's great. I've learned so much from it, and I'm only halfway through it because I left it at home. But all sorts of tips in there that are just going to make the emails like actually get read and digested and get the results you want. So I, I think that's a really good one because we do so much by email still. Awesome. Um, ladies, absolute pleasure speaking to you. Some really amazing things that we've talked about there, and I've learned a lot um, during our conversation. Thank you for your time. I know you've both got to jump off and, and catch flights and back home and see those families after working hard at the conference so i appreciate your time thanks for coming on the podcast we appreciate it thank you for having us one last thing before everyone jumps away the place that, that people can go to if they wish to learn more information about the uh, the women's veterinary leadership development initiative where do people go to find more information and sign up to that and get more data so we have a website and we have a facebook group and paid is a page actually to Correct. follow and a twitter feed so any of those uh would be the direct way what's your website www.wvldi.org dot org. okay great and similar same uh facebook.com forward slash wvldi yes perfect okay so if this is a topic that grabbed you then uh jump on there and i assure you you will be getting some awesome information from some super inspiring ladies and men Oh, and men as well. Yes, yes, yes we, have, we do have men on the men team. Men on the board. <laughs> Fantastic. There we go. A duff assumption by me there. No. I actually meant you guys. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, here we are giving credit to everyone else. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Work in progress. Yes. All right. Thanks very much for be being on. Thank you. Thank you. Hello again folks just me signing off the podcast wasn't that awesome karen and kim were such good guests and my eternal gratitude for having them on the show now if you enjoyed the podcast if you got value out of it things that you can learn listen to and you want to hear more please 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 let me know give me some feedback and most importantly jump on itunes and leave me a review that makes a big difference when it comes to ranking and how many people actually see the podcast the more people listen to it the more likely I am to do more of them in the future and the more leverage I have to get awesome guests on the 
the show. So thank you for listening, and until the next edition of Blunt Dissection, this is Dave signing off. Bye.